Northeastern and, and our research group. We've had uh, students from, from Northeastern come through uh, and, and work on designs of these systems that involve a whole range from uh, very small composite aircraft that we use to fly over the north slope of Alaska just 10 meters above the surface, looking at the flux of carbon out of melt zones in the Arctic. We also use uh, a B-57 bomber that was built in the 1960s to fly at 70,000 feet and uh, loiter with a nuclear weapon in its uh, underbelly. But we took that aircraft along with NASA and painted it white and we're now using that platform to study uh, everything from stratospheric ozone to the relationship between convective storms and the injection of water into these systems. And that involves developing laser systems and building these in, in our lab. And so um, if I don't get to that uh, particular point, I just want to say uh, and underline the fact that this co-op program Northeastern is a fantastically successful uh, contributor to many, many science and technology areas in all of New England. So let's get back to this issue of, of climate and how we describe it. Um, well, I want to make the case that representing warming of the climate is not the proper approach. I do have to pull up this front page of the New York Times this morning that pointed out that mentioned before, that 2012 was by far the hottest uh, year on, on record, and it wasn't even close. It was running three and a half degrees above the previous max. And it was particularly uh, focused in the core of the Middle West. Um, and this uh, was represented by the statistical distribution in different cities. Now, the West Coast actually was rather cold and rainy. Everything else was uh, considerably hotter. I mean, Washington, D.C. had 200. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you should revolt. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now what was I saying? <laughs> OK, let's pick on Washington, because of course, uh, that's an appropriate place to think about this. 250, 247 days were warmer than average. Only 109 were cooler. And this is a huge difference. You can see Houston, uh, Chicago was uh, 245 days warmer. Anyway, so this temperature increase is clearly catching up and clearly representing itself statistically. But the issue of describing the change in the structure as global warming carries with it the connotation that it's slow and it's reversible. And the reversible nature of this climate change is really the thing I'm going to focus on because it's, these are not reversible changes, they're irreversible changes. And one of the reasons that global warming is so ineffective in describing this is that 70% of the Earth's surface is, is ocean. And the ocean has massive heat capacity. So it takes in this excess heat, but it modulates dramatically the change in the global average temperature because of that. But more than that, it's the ice systems at the two poles, and then the third pole is over Tibet. That ice uh, doesn't change temperatures and approaches the freezing point until all of it's gone. So all of these factors tend to control the average measured temperature change globally. So we want to turn this issue around and we want to look at the uh, problem in terms of climate instability. And the reason that that formulation is so important is that instability is directly linked to irreversibility. So when we have a system that is characterized by this beautiful and delicate balance between the tropical heat and the polar cold, when we move to a condition in which that ice has disappeared, it's very easy to move in this direction. It just takes a small amount of heat. These cryogenic systems are incredibly delicate, but they don't convert back to the original state with this balance between cold pole and tropics. And we know the connection with 
increasing severe storm intensity and frequency because of that. So when we look at this, we can represent this as a surface. Uh, if you wish, you can imagine either a chemical reaction if you're a chemist or a rolling sphere <coughs> on a, on a system that modulates with respect to its height and stability. And this climate state that we have now sits in a local stable point with its cold poles, but um, it can proceed very easily over that barrier by the flow of heat in the system itself to a new climate state. And getting back to this original point uh, is profoundly difficult because the carbon dioxide that we put in the atmosphere now 20% of it will still be there 20,000 years from now. So the trapping of infrared radiation by the carbon dioxide we release puts us into a situation in which getting back to this very delicate balance we have now is profoundly difficult. So let's look at a few numbers. First of all, the way this works, of course, is the sun is the primary driving agent for the climate. We have visible radiation uh, and near-infrared radiation coming in on the Earth, um, just as a, a, a very handy number, we get about one and a half, 10 to the 18 kilowatt hours of energy received at the Earth, and we reflect about a third of that back. So a very important number is that difference is very close to one, 10 to the 18 kilowatt hours of energy. And what happens is that that goes into the climate system, and that same amount of energy is then radiated from the outer skin of the atmosphere. But that outer skin of the atmosphere is separated from the Earth's surface by the atmosphere, the clouds, the water vapor, and so on. So we have to cut into the system and look at what actually happens. So in comes this 1.5 to 18 kilowatt hours. And remember, you pay about 20 cents a kilowatt hour for energy. <laughs> but it's an energy unit, so you can calculate how much that's worth. So out of the skin is this net input of 110 to 18 kilowatt hours. And cycling inside the system is almost twice that much energy. And that's a little counterintuitive. But when we wear clothes, uh, our bodies are radiating infrared radiation into our clothes. Clothes radiate back. The walls radiate in. If we actually calculated the infrared radiation from our bodies at 38 Celsius, which is our body temperature, we'd have to eat 40,000 calories of food each day to just sustain that. And the reason we only need 2,000 is that everything's radiating back into us. So all we have to do is make up that small difference. So energy exchange in the infrared is extremely important. And one of my observations over time is that probably has the same feeling that if we could see in the infrared, we'd never vote the way we do. I think if somebody's thinking about a really cool movie to make, you could make a movie in the infrared that would really shock them because this is a massive amount of energy. So let's get back to this reversibility, irreversibility question. So the time scale for irreversible change then is set by feedbacks in the climate scale. So when we progress from the current climate state to the new climate state, it's those feedbacks that are driving the system. And those are the ones that are so difficult to, to quantify. But I think many of you have seen this fact that if, if we look at the Arctic uh, and the uh, colored area here in the middle of September of 1980, showed almost complete inclusion of the Arctic Ocean by ice. And if I went back to 1955, it would be completely locked in. And in 1955, the average depth of that ice cap was three and a half meters. And we know that from data that we have from uh, nuclear submarines. And when that ice was fixed, they became extremely interested in the, in the topography under the ice because the submarines were moving back and forth and they needed to know that. Now, the average depth is 1.2 meters. And look at the area uh, in the middle of September of this last year. 
this is a remarkably rapid occurrence of the melting of this ice. And one of the things that we can do, we can look back at 2007, we have the satellite data, which was the first really bad year that represented the irreversible change in the system. So we're now looking down, this is Greenland, and we're now into May, June, and as we get into the early summer, you can see the contraction of the ice are now into July, August, and early September, and this is now the 16th of September, 2007. And at that point, the entire community of climate scientists was shocked because when you look at the expectation for what is to occur, um, it turns out that that year the, the <coughs> international report that got the Nobel Prize was released, and I'll, I'll show you in just a minute, it forecast more ice that was released in August of 2007. It forecast more ice at the end of the century than was present when the ink dried in the document. And that is a massive miscalculation but it wasn't the fault of the people writing it, they were doing their best, it was the feedbacks that overtook the system so rapidly that it was, um, this occurred 80 years earlier than was expected. So let's look at the number. Remember we had two 10 to the 18 kilowatt hours per year uh, cycling between your surface and the clouds, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and so on. By the way, I, I showed that slide uh, in a Senate testimony, and I, I asked the staffer if it was all right if I used exponential representation. And they rocked back and said, well, you know, this is, these are senators. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, uh, how about a million trillion instead of 10 to the 18? So that's fine. <laughs> and when part of the campaign, trillion as part of the deficit, yeah, that's, that, that's fine. So uh, now, four weeks later, I was in China testifying in the, the, the upper levels of the Chinese government, and I quietly asked the same problem, the same question. And they looked at me like, we flew you all the way over here to insult us? <laughs> said, okay, fine, it's exponential. <laughs> and, but it was a very enlightening, <coughs> Experience because the upper echelon of the Chinese government is extremely astute technically. It's remarkable. And it's something we need to think about. Okay, so back to the point. If I look at the rate at which that Arctic ice is melting, I can calculate that very quickly because all I need to know is the volume of ice that disappears each year and the heat of fusion per unit volume, and I can do that calculation. That number turns out to be about 310 to 13 kilowatt hours per year. So that's a part of 50,000 of the circulating energy in the system. That's all that's required to melt that Arctic ice at the rate it's melting. That is a crucial number because a very, very small change in the trapping of that infrared radiation is why the Arctic ice cap disappeared as quickly as it did. Okay, so. Um, uh, was it uh, expected? No, it wasn't expected. This is this international um, uh, panel on climate change that released this report in 2007. And as I mentioned before, uh, that forecast, uh, 1980 to 2000 average is here. We've looked at that before. And they forecast this amount at the end of the century, which, as I pointed out before, is considerably more than existed. Um, in September of 2007. So what, what, what went wrong? Well, the feedbacks are the thing we want to look at. And those feedbacks involve the intrusion of warm ocean water from low latitudes. As the ice pulls back, this warm water can pour in both from the, from the uh, Pacific and from the Atlantic side. Also, as the snow and ice disappears around the, the, the Arctic basin, this warm air comes in, and rather than having its radiation emitted into the ground and, and never to return because of that ice and snow, actually the, the warm ground keeps that air 
very high in internal energy, so it pumps a huge amount of heat into the Arctic Basin. The next thing that happened, sorry? Where's the North Pole? The North Pole is right there. Right, sorry. So the next part of this is that, that any emitting body radiates infrared radiation with the fourth power of the temperature. So when you pull cold ice back and, and uh, open up warm water, it emits a huge amount of infrared radiation that then comes up, absorbed by the atmosphere, and re-emitted down. So it bathes the entire Arctic basin in that much higher infrared background. But interestingly, it's the summer solar radiation falling on this Arctic Ocean that makes a huge difference for two reasons. One, of course, is ocean water is black, so virtually all of that radiation absorbs whereas it used to be reflected. But interestingly, and in, in retrospect, obviously, that heat goes into the upper five or six meters of the Arctic Ocean. And that ice is now only a meter and a half thick, so it's the storage of that radiation in the very <coughs> surface waters that accelerates this dramatically. And all, all of those feedbacks uh, are clear, they're powerful, they're potent, but they weren't included in large measure in those climate forecasts. And so this was really the beginning of a cascade of feedbacks emerging from the loss of Arctic ice that I want to talk about very briefly. So five years ago, we believe the Arctic ice cap would last to the end of the century. Three years ago, we thought it would last until 2050. Uh, now we know that uh, it will last no longer than 2025. It will probably be gone. Permanent ice will be gone somewhere between 2020 and 2025. And this turns out to be a hugely crucial step in the irreversible change of the climate structure. Why do we care? Well, it depends on who you ask. Um, let's ask Shell. They're, um, they're very interested in melting ice because they want to drill in the Arctic. The Arctic has a third of the total petroleum and natural gas reserves, along with mineral reserves. And they don't seem to be the least bit bothered by the irony of this. And in fact, um, it was just last week they lost control of this drilling rig. I think you all saw that. So this is a, a remarkable issue. If it's there, it's a drill for it. And the question now becomes one of ethics. When we look back at this system, this Arctic basin, the removal of that Arctic ice has two huge effects. One is the Greenland, which has uh, seven meters of sea level rise contained in its glacial structure, it was sealed off for the, really for the last two and a half million years by the presence of this Arctic ice cap. And the ice is 3,000 meters thick along the spine of Greenland huge mass of ice. So were it to melt, it would raise the global ocean level by seven meters. But the other aspect is that the containment of carbon, methane and carbon dioxide in the soils of Siberia and northern Alaska represents a source such that if half a percent of that melts each year, that doubles the total carbon added by all fossil fuel combustion. Now that is a feedback of profound importance. So let's look at Greenland first. If, if we went back to 1980, there would be no surface melt at all in Greenland through the entire winter. This is the maximum amount of melt in the summer. These are satellite data, uh, radar data, radar uh, uh, the propagation of the radar signals absorbed dramatically by water, but it's transmitted almost without uh, attenuation by ice. So we have all of this record. 1980, no melting. 1992, you can start to see the skirts begin to melt. 2002, 
really significant intrusion in 2005. This last summer, the entire surface of Greenland was meltwater. Now, it doesn't roll off Greenland like water on a duck's back. It has a very different impact because what happens is the fissures in the ice structure um, provide the capability for this meltwater, and this is an actual picture from, from Greenland, to, to go 3,000 meters down through that ice to the bedrock. And the physical stability of Greenland is established by the bond between ice and the bedrock. So an analogy is, a, uh, is Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, these flying buttresses that were a favorite architectural feature are there to contain a horizontal expansion of that structure because if you take them away, the mass of this collapses downward and outward. It has exactly the same structure as the green inflation. So the beautiful flying buttresses are really a representation of that physical structure. So let's pick on what happens when we lubricate the base of the ice on this bedrock. Let's pick on Harvard University. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is the, the real estate owned by Harvard along with Charles, and you know, you know where you are. Right? OK, so let's add one meter of sea level rise to this. Um, now, uh, the athletic fields go underwater with just a meter of sea level rise. And you can see there's some intrusion in the, in the back bay area. Now, Harvard is 400 years old. It's about to drop $10 billion on, on, on a campus investment in Alston. Um, now, we informed the leadership of the university in 2008 that there was a problem here. The alums are very smart. They actually read. And they're not going to invest in something that looks like this. So what's plan B? Well, it turns out that the financial collapse terminated plans for building <laughs> but now they're beginning to pick up steam again. So we now have a committee working on plan B, and uh, I don't have time to go into that. I just <laughs> I just want to add a couple more meters to this. Uh, so that's three meters of sea level rise. Now that's 40% of Greenland. Now the only good news here is that MIT goes under <laughs> <laughs> good news in this, is, and, and I, of course, if we look at Miami, uh, three meters takes out the, the full southern quarter of Florida. Florida is extremely low, flat to the Gulf Coast, I can show you that. Manhattan, you lose a large segment of the southern uh, end of Manhattan. If you look at capitals around the country, this issue is profoundly Serious, and of course, when you add storm surge, as we saw with Hurricane Sandy, it makes this significantly worse. So, this is a manifestation of the feedback coming directly out of the loss of Arctic ice. Now, New York, Mayor Bloomberg turns out, as many of you know, to be uh, very astute. He's invested a considerable amount in deciding how New York is going to protect itself from sea level rise. This, this, this was uh, in early September. This was uh, before Sandy hit. Because Sandy was, was three meters of storm surge. Uh, and so it was pretty clear what would happen. Now, of course, that went back out to sea after the storm surge was over. That's the big difference. And I don't know if you've seen pictures of the electrical systems in the subway that were submerged in salt water, but it's a remarkable sight. Okay, so let's step to the other feedback, and that comes from this remarkable material called methane clathrates. And these are water cages with methane trapped within them, and methane is produced by anaerobic decomposition of organic material. And these clathrates are, are everywhere. There's three times the chemical energy tied up in methane clathrates than some of all coal, petroleum, and natural gas worldwide. I mean, this is everywhere. And it's formed because nature pours a vacuum, so it's an entropy argument, really, that inserts methane into the structure, stabilizes it. 
And this is an example. This is just a um, bottom material pulled up from 200 meters below the surface off the west coast. You just take a cigarette lighter to it um, when it goes up the plane. And this, combined with the carbon dioxide type of permafrost, is the worry uh, as the melt zones of the Arctic expand into the soil systems. And just to, to reiterate, <coughs> as I mentioned before, we plot the carbon dioxide emission in gigatons per year on the vertical axis. It's 5, 10, 15 gigatons per year uh, against time, 1990 to 2010. This was this IPCC uh, scenario for release of carbon dioxide. This was the worst case. This came out of the 2007 report. This was the worst case. Well, even before it was released, we were putting far more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than the worst case. And that's continued uh, to this day, but just a half a percent melt rate takes us from this point to this point per year. Uh, so this issue is one of crucial concern. We're spending a huge amount of time on it now, developing experimental systems to map this out. So let's get back to who's in control and why does it matter? And this comes primarily from this complete restructuring of the energy uh, picture globally. And fracking, of course, is a centerpiece that opened up massive amounts of, uh, <coughs> of natural gas. And also, you know, these fracking wells also uh, provide a huge increase in the petroleum release because natural gas and petroleum co coexist, it turns out that both of them come out of these fracking wells. And then the offshore drilling is getting more and more sophisticated. And so in, in 2012, um, there was a clear global inventory of both oil and, and natural gas. And one of the key points is that when we look at petroleum imports into the United States, which Cost us about four hundred billion a year. It's a major part of the imbalance of payments. The primary country that we import from is Canada, Mexico, and Venezuela are second, and third. We only get about ten to twelve percent of our petroleum from, from the Middle East now. And that's a very important number that we'll think about moving into the future. So let's look at what is driving the demand for petroleum. This is really profoundly important to key, and that is it's driven by a product of population times per capita income times the power required to produce a dollar of GDP. So if you look at global population, that's 160,000 years ago that, that modern humans emerged from the plains of Africa. And everybody has a definition of a modern human. Mine is that if you provide a toothbrush, uh, a bath, and a couple of other amenities and put them in a freshman class. You won't be able to tell them from a normal freshman class and they'll do just about as well as everybody else. So everybody has their definition and that's mine. And it was a tough 6,000 generations. It wasn't until the um, American Revolution that the world population reached one billion. And of course, this was primarily agriculture that was driving this up. So in the, 19, the Second World War, 2.3 billion, just past 2 billion in, in 1945. And then in one, about 7,000 generations it took to get to 2 billion. And in one human lifetime, we're going somewhere between 9 and, and 11 billion. The United Nations now predicts it could be about 10. And it will, it will flatten off. But it's the multiplicative factor that comes from this per capita income that amplifies the total global power demand dramatically. Because when population moves from the rural area into the urban area, it happens very quickly. When we, when we look at China and India and areas in South America, this acceleration in that second term far outstrips the population. And then the energy demand per dollar, technology is beginning to help with that a little bit, but, but at this juncture, it has very little impact. So we can calculate this 
for 2005, 15 times 10 to the 12 watts, or 15 terawatts is the global consumption. Um, and which is recalculated in 2050 using the, the best figures, and it's around 40 terawatts. So you know, we have a, a, a difference of, of 25 terawatts. But what does that number actually mean? When we calculate it and multiply it into this uh, population factor, you can see that the energy consumption is vastly outstripping the population. And uh, we're now up to the point where we have you know, four, four terawatts per billion people by the middle of the century. And if, if I just represent that as what it meaning in real terms, about 80% of our primary energy comes from fossil fuels. So let me just pick on um, coal and natural gas as the source and to show you what those numbers look like. We're going to create that 25 terawatt difference in power demand between now and 2050. We have to build two 500, 600 megawatt power plants per day for the next 40 years. That's how big that figure is. If you want to do it with nuclear, you can you can do that in about one uh, one gigawatt nuclear reactor per day. So when you listen to these discussions about licensing one nuclear reactor that takes months and months, you just realize how <coughs> inappropriate it is compared to the scale of the problem. This is a massive increase in energy. And so now we're pumping more and more carbon dioxide into that circulating infrared system that's pumping a fraction of that into the ice system. So you can see how the heat is beginning to run away. Now let's look very quickly at what this fracking means. This, is, this was the, the official estimate in 2011. That has now been revised from the United States, raising the um, available extractable gas from 273 trillion cubic feet to 3,000 trillion. This is just uh, absolutely mind-boggling amounts of energy that's available. And it's cheap. In fact, the wellhead price for natural gas per unit of energy is a tenth of that petroleum. Okay, now, why do we care and who's in control? Well, this is a nice article, that, you know, one of many that came out from the uh, New York Times. Fossil fuel industry has dominated TV campaign. Um, so the question is, we know who's in control now. The question is, who's in control in the future? And here's where universities have a massive responsibility. And as I will, Express in just the next couple of minutes, I think universities, including mine, have failed dramatically in not providing their graduates with the information that they need to execute decisions in a modern democracy. And when you walk out of the university with a diploma, you have to know the technical forces that are shaping the modern world. That's the university's responsibility. Where are the frontiers for innovation? And what are the implications of that? Do those frontiers hold for any profession? Not just technology, physics, and <coughs> international economics, government, ethics, public health, education, all require a foundation of understanding of those. And the issue about public policy and strategies have to be founded on sound scientific information. And there's very little sound scientific information for them. If you watch a presidential primary debate, it's just unbelievable what goes back and forth on that stage. And the journalists are sitting there doing the interrogation. They apparently don't know enough to stop this complete flow of misinformation that is really a reflection of the failure of universities across the country to properly educate students. And so we tend to have these separated uh, uh, pursuits that public policy and government and economics actually are quite effectively joined in many curricula. What, the science departments? Is it the science departments? 
physics department has its courses that it uses to flunk out everybody and can get its hands on. <laughs> Chemistry isn't any better. And they're completely separate. So they'll teach thermodynamics and quantum mechanics with one language, the same. So there's no connection between the two, and there's no link between those and what's going on globally. And this is a profoundly important problem that uh, we're starting to make some progress on. And of course, the point is to not only join physical sciences so that it presents an interesting combination, but to link it into the larger global context. Because if you don't have the big picture uh, embedded in the presentation of those fundamentals, the students are bored. They'll never come back and take another science course. And they graduate from the university ready to monitor uh, presidential Right. Okay. So this union then <coughs> represents the, the really crucial transition in the universities taking responsibility. And of course, the numbers are staggering in terms of how many uh, freshmen and sophomores have driven out of the physical sciences. So rather than, than attempting to flunk students out, the whole challenge is to draw the students in the mix profoundly exciting because these basic principles allow you to address the future in a way that provide huge opportunities. So it isn't just a question of getting a Nobel Prize in one of the sciences. It's a question of how you function in modern society without that basic information. And that's why the entire process has to be inverted to draw students into this rather than driving them. Okay, so what's the dynamic of higher education? This is the plot. That's, um, every university is a little different. This is the one for ours. You start with 60% of students interested in science, and uh, 10 to 15% come out the top. They do very well in graduate school and medical school, but what about the rest of the world? Well, um, this zone of technical illiteracy is what results. And it's doubly bad because there are 2 million students graduating from universities in this country each year, but each of them have two parents. And so there are 6 million people involved. So one is two, which one is one minute? <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> Okay, how many of you want me to quit right now? <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is a crucial problem because if, if the student comes home and, and asks, you know, it's fifty thousand dollars of tuition a year, well what did you learn? There ought to be a good answer to that. And this is something that, that has to be faced because national security, economic considerations and all of it depend on on a graduating class across the country that looks like this. So students are drawn in, not necessarily with you know, higher level calculus at every step. That's not the point. The point is to infuse these basic ideas into the curriculum so that they are seamless and, and absolutely connected. And we would have a very, very different country. So um, that brings me to the, uh, the interesting part of how Eastern ties into the research structure we have, but I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs>